I want to remind everyone that we are now recording. Um, and thank you all for being here. We're so honored, as I said, when, when Wendy told us that nice thing that people choose to spend an hour with us every week. It's a really special and a nice way to get together and also to celebrate the great artists we have working in the building and having exhibitions. And then the fact that we have this wonderful record on our YouTube channel of all of these talks um, is great and really shows off all of the creative activity that happens at the Clay Studio. Well, not all of it, I should say, a little slice. There's lots of, there's thousands of things happening at every moment, but um, we get to share this a little bit with you. I wanna um, let everybody know that we, we want you to mark your calendars for October 2nd which is gonna be an event and an open house that will be uh, a proper send off for our current building, spe speaking of moving. Um, that's gonna be kind of the end of the exhibition program in Old City. The shop will stay open uh, through the holidays, but we are um, kind of shutting down the exhibitions as we have to plan for the move and, and move our collection. And speaking of our collection, the items in the final exhibition of proper send off um, are going to be part of an auction and the proceeds from that auction will benefit um, storing housing um, and display cases for the collection in the new building so that we can bring it out of the basement and let everybody take a look i love the cat tail that's so great um, i also want to acknowledge that the clay studio is on the traditional territory of the lenny lenape people the Lenape are the original inhabitants of Delaware, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, and Southern New York. And for over 10,000 years, they've been the caretakers of these lands and of the Delaware River. Um, Lenape, Lenny Lenape means original people. Over a period of 250 years, many Lenape people were removed and dispersed throughout the country. Some took refuge with other tribes, but a large number of Lenape families remain in the homelands. This acknowledgement itself is a small gesture. We hope to offer it as an opening to greater public consciousness of native sovereignty and cultural rights. And I encourage you to learn more about the Lenape people of today and of their history. Again, we are recording. So welcome to Kopal Seth, who is um, with us today and she's sitting in her wonderful ex exhibition, Systematic Chaos. Kopal Seth was born in a rural town in India called Karai. Seth's work tours through her memories of growing up in a unique culture while moving away from home for better opportunities. She earned her BFA in painting with a minor in ceramics at um, the Faculty of Fine Arts, Maharaja Sayajirao. I was practicing that, I don't know if I said it correctly, University of Baroda, Vadodara, India. She is a recent graduate from the Rhode Island School of Design where she earned her MFA in ceramics Seth has shown at various exhibitions in India and the US, amongst which are shows at the Gelman Gallery, RISD Museum, the Lacoste King Gallery, Concord, Massachusetts, and art-centric space in New Delhi. She is currently a resident artist at the Clay Studio. Welcome, Kopal. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on Lunch and Learn yeah. to share my work with you. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to start out with my standard question, which is how and why did you make the brave decision to make your life in art? Oh, well, um, so it, it came quite naturally to me. As a kid growing up, I was a crafty kid when everybody was like playing outside on the summer break. I was like watching um, craft shows on TV and gathering all my paper and glue and making uh, paper mache puppets with it and got in trouble for some of those scary ones at school as well. So I want to hear more about that. You got in trouble because <laughs> your puppet was too scary. Yeah. So uh, I went to a boarding school and I made uh, a scary hand puppet. And uh, after lights out, we, I was trying to scare some of my friends, but <laughs> accidentally scared the teacher. So we got in a lot of trouble for that. My parents actually got a call about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, it wasn't the art yeah. itself, it was that you were trying to scare people with it. <laughs> <laughs> you, um, so early on, you could tell that art could make an emotional impact on people. Definitely. 
<laughs> Definitely. Um, so yeah, when it came to um, deciding what I wanted to study, um, so in India, the education system, how it works is um, you get to select your subjects. So until 10th standard, you study everything. Um, and then post 10th grade for your 11th and 12th grade, you get to pick your subjects. So when it came time to deciding that I was uh, leaning towards arts and my school fortunately had an arts course. So I enrolled into that. And from there on, it was um, like a decision between, uh, between design and fine arts. And I was definitely leaning more towards fine, on, fine art but I wasn't really aware of ceramics at that moment. So my most natural uh, play, oh, I'm so sorry. No, oh, that's fine. You're good. Oh, no, it's back. Oh, I'm, You're back. I'm so You're sorry back. for that. Yeah, um, okay. yeah, so the most natural, um, so I enrolled into a painting program uh, where I got to take some electives um, throughout my undergrad years. And um, so one of the electives was ceramics, but uh, so one of the electives was like options was ceramics, printmaking. So I was like, oh, let me try my hand at pottery. Maybe I will never do it again, but it looks really fun. So I just want to try it out. And during my semester of pottery, I really got involved in it and I got an opportunity to see a Raku firing. So that entire process of like hot pots coming out of the kiln and getting shocked and getting these beautiful cracks all around them was just amazing to me. And it totally drew me into the whole process of ceramics. And after that point, even within my painting practice, I was drawn to material. So I wasn't painting on traditional canvas and with paint. I was making my own base with plaster, cement, paper mache. And so I was really involved into the process of sort of making my own base and then painting over it. Mm. So, um, yeah, uh, and then I decided to sort of see that through for my grad program. And I applied to like various colleges um, for a ceramics program because I really wanted to study more of the materiality and the processes that are in, like that are part of the part of ceramics. Um, so yeah, it, that felt like a very natural transition for me, and I was fortunate enough to have the opportunities come my way that way, so I could pursue them. Um, yeah. So that and that's when you made that another brave decision, which was to come to the US for grad school. Mm -hmm. Did you apply <laughs> to places in India or other places or did you really want to mm -hmm. come here? Um, I definitely wanted to explore something outside of the country. So I was considering uh, ceramic programs in the UK and the US mostly. Um, and I really wanted to go to a really like good school if I was gonna be making a big investment like this. I wanted to do it from a really, really nice school. Um, and um, because in India, even though uh, there are programs um, in India for ceramics now, um, they weren't as advanced and definitely the infrastructure isn't enough, especially at the level that I wanted to pursue it at. Um, so uh, going outside of the country seemed like, uh, a better idea and a better fit for what I was thinking at that moment. So, and then I applied everywhere. And then fortunately, again, I got accepted to RISD, which is a wonderful school. And I had such a transformative educational experience over there, really changed my entire practice and the way I approach art. Um, so, great. Yeah. That's great to hear. Do you wanna talk a little bit more about that idea of how did it change your approach? Mm -hmm. um, so that was, so just go like in at RISD, I weirdly, I still can't imagine, like I still can't believe sometimes like that was part of my educational experience. We got uh, an opportunity to visit China and Jingdezhen. Mm -hmm. uh, so Central Academy of Fine Arts in China in 
invited our entire department to visit them and go see Jing the Zhen. So just being surrounded by that much ceramics and learning all the history about uh, China and how like ceramics happen to be and how important it is and how deeply ingrained it is in their culture. It got me thinking about ceramic history and clay histories of India. Mm. And because China and graphic, there is a very clear um, lack of, um, I want to say, fine luxury ceramics. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like, it's not as deeply, even though it is. Is very rooted in as ceramics in China. Mm. So I was studying more and more about, okay, what are the histories of Indian ceramics and how how can we take it forward and sort of get it to um, sort of re uh, reimagine it in a contemporary context so it can sort of grow from there because mm. it is a dying tradition right now. Mm. Not a lot of people are practicing it. Um, it, is, it, is, it is sort of becoming less and less part of our culture. So um, it's sort of, uh, so that trip sort of somehow, like in my head, I made a connection where um, geographically those two places are so close. And yet there is like a very clear difference between South Asian ceramics and East Asian ceramics, like a very distinctive difference. Um, so I wanted to explore that difference basically and uh, figure out a place where um, especially Indian terracotta and ceramics can find a new like new vision in like a contemporary context maybe mm. so yeah that that's so you know i've i've heard that from others that you have to leave a place to really mm. understand the place because you see the differences and you actually mm -hmm. went to, you went to had to go to two places right <laughs> you had to come to the u.s and then go almost <laughs> all the way back to see that yep <laughs> that's beautiful though and it it really um I think is going to lead you to make a big impact on the Indian ceramics community because you can see all those things so we're having a little bit of lag so I'm gonna just um mm -hmm. I'm gonna suggest that you go over to Josie's desk like we talked about um just leave okay leave it on mute and on um mm -hmm. on there and then over to Josie's and then she's there. So you can just be able to sit down. Sorry, everybody bear with us. We're just um, want to make sure that it's easy to hear what Coppola is saying. Ooh, she disappeared. See where she went. Yeah, I knew this was going to happen, but I really wanted her to sit in the gallery. Um, so when we're done talking, we'll go back in the gallery and she can show us around. But she should be appearing any moment back in Josie's, Josie's spot there. I really have heard from, oh, there we go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, you're back. Excellent. Um, yeah, sorry about that, but this is fine because you'll be able to hear you better. It was pretty much fine, but it just seemed like it might keep breaking up. So this is a great opportunity now for me to share the screen so that we can go through your presentation. Uh, hold on one moment while we get that going. Let's see. Okay, can you see that okay, Coco? Yes. Great. All right, you can just tell me when you want me to change the slide. Uh -huh. um, so I, in the presentation, I have included some pictures of my painting work that I was doing in undergrad. And uh, even when I was painting, I was thinking a lot about space and um, like corners have somehow fascinated me. They are sort of my comfort place. Every time I am overwhelmed by everything that's happening in the world, I naturally like gravitate towards 
a little corner to sort of center myself and um, deal with everything and then move on uh, clearly. So I've been fascinated by corners and uh, all the natural things that happen in corners due to time, weather, paint, and they create these abstract patterns and um, like little bit of like landscapes uh, from like a bird's eye view. So my entire, um, uh, my entire like idea of like looking at something from a bird's eye view sort of came from these watermarks on walls where they look like landscapes. And growing up, I was fortunate enough to have opportunities where I would, I, my parents like flew with me uh, to places. So I was like always looking down the plane window and really fascinated by how things look from like a bird's eye view. And when I was like uh, living alone, uh, this is like the corners would be uh, the places where I would find the most comfort. And then I would notice all these nuances of different shades of white and how um, like water sort of travels through and like sort of makes an imprint of itself and captures the time within these spaces. Um, so that's what I was painting. Um, so maybe next slide. So that's what most of my painting work is about um, next. Um, and then again, like I mentioned earlier, that I was um, really interested in building up my own base. Um, and um, so I started using a lot of like found objects that I found and uh, just I would stuff it with plaster or cement to sort of make a flat base. Um, so next one um, to maybe like paint upon. And I was using a lot of like textured material like gesso to create different planes on my paintings. Um, next. Um, so yeah, so this piece particularly are backrests of chairs that I found at a flea market in India. And I was really intrigued by the cane work that they had. And it looked like um, when you're looking at an atlas and there are those like lines uh, on it, it sort of reminded me of that. And I wanted to play with that texture with some smooth texture and create uh, like a cart uh, cartographic vocabulary of my own essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so I was using a lot of like found objects um, next. So like even within, um, uh, I was like even throughout my painting like a uh, uh, degree I was exploring various materials and I wanted to sort of pursue that more, uh, more intensely. Um, next. And that looks like screen. Mm -hmm. So that this piece in particular um, uh, was inspired by like construction and demolition that was going on near my uh, like neighborhood that I was living in. And there were these beautiful like chunks of wall which were just left behind in wreckage. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to capture that feeling and the essence of those wreckage within this piece where it was very much part of the wall and yet it looked like it was peeling off and coming uh, away from the structure and and like it had captured some of the water damage and um, like just essentially a passage of time. Uh, so I wanted to uh, capture that feeling. Um, next. So from here, uh, this is some of my ceramic work from RISD after that uh, China trip um, uh, where I was really thinking about um, traditional forms. And I was thinking about it in terms of shapes and vessels that were that are important in like Chinese uh, culture and how and if if there were similar sort of pieces in like in Indian traditions um, and I I thought the matka was a very close um, sort of a pot to a moon jar 
Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I thought that would like a matka is sort of like an Indian moon jar, but the unique quality about a matka is that it is a low fire terracotta pot, which has a round bottom. So it doesn't have a feet. It doesn't have any feet essentially. Um, so it rests on a pillow of fabric or like a pillow of recycled paper. So we make a little donut ring of cloth and it sits on that. So matkas are made out of terracotta and have, uh, are, because of their porous quality, are used to store water uh, over the summer to keep the water cold and regulate the temperature. A lot of, like these spots can be like seen around town as public watering uh, places. So if you're walking in the heat on the street, you will like in every like 10 or 15 feet, you will find like some matkas where you can drink water out of uh, because the summers are really hot and everybody wants to be hydrated. So shopkeepers will have them. And if you're on the street, passerby, you can just help yourself to the water. Um, So I thought this shape and form was very involved and integrated into the Indian lifestyle. And yet it is running out of its popularity and use. Um, So I wanted to uh, like take a little, like add a little bit of my spin uh, to it in somewhat of an illustrative way where it like narrates um, story and adds a little meaning to it and maybe in, in hopes that it could find a place in the contemporary art context. Um, So this particular piece uh, was again, directly inspired by the streets of India. One of my favorite things about home is the streets and the hustle and bustle and just the amount of, the sheer amount of activity that goes on in like matter of seconds. uh, so like if you like if you ever visit India, this would be a very common sight, especially in a town like mine, where uh, matka vendors would have stacks and stacks of pots, giant pots, and they would make pyramids and like sculptural structures of them and like surround themselves in essentially a little um, cave of pots and then like that would be their shop and that's how they would sell the matka. So this piece was directly uh, inspired that by that because I wanted to sort of um, create that sculptural quality that they have on the street with the assemblage of these pots. And uh, they're definitely not thinking about it in a sculptural sense. It's just out of necessity because they want to make a shade for themselves while like throughout the day um, selling the pots on the street so I wanted to recreate, um, like capture some of that sculptural quality of those arrangements here. And that they have to, they're not intentionally sculptural, but they have to be structural because they have to mm-hmm. be able to not fall down. And mm-hmm. are those the people who are making the pots or the people who are selling drinks or something in, in them? Um, so it's both, they can be found. Uh, so mostly, the larger sculptural thing that I was imagining was mostly the vendors. But if you went to food vendors who use uh, terracotta cups called kullar for chai, uh, they would also have a pile of them stacked uh, on top of each other in like a very sculptural uh, way um, to sort of, but out of like sheerly all out of practical reasons and for like space conservation. So everything's like stacked on top of each other. That whole idea really fascinated me and I wanted to like um, use that and see how, what that does uh, in like a sculptural context. Yeah, and you and I have talked a little bit about your interest in how these things are um, sustainable. You know, this isn't, mm-hmm. these are not plastic water bottles. These are things mm-hmm. that are, um, mm-hmm you know, not damaging the earth yeah. in that way. Mm-hmm. They are very low fired. Um, so so the, the terracotta uh, pieces that are uh, very like 
that are traditionally part of the Indian culture are mostly disposable pieces. Instead of using plastic, they're very low fire pieces. And uh, so they decompose over like, uh, I wanna say like maybe six or seven years, they'll just become part of the soil again. Um, and a lot of the people uh, like, especially like the older generation prefers and chooses to drink out of these pots. And that this is like their preferred way, like preferred utensil essentially, because when you're consuming something out of the pot because of the low fire quality, some of the flavoring of the clay gets into your uh, um, drink or whatever you're consuming out of this pot, which adds a very earthy umami flavor to your dish. So a lot of the people over time have acquired a preferred taste for food out of these containers, I like terracotta containers. So they are definitely um, like preferred use and sustainable. Um, this was again, like similar idea where I was um, playing with the notion of uh, marketplace and assemblage and light and shadow. And actually this piece was conceived in the thick of the pandemic month, uh, like right, like maybe one month after pandemic, we had lost studio access during our thesis semester and still had to write a thesis and make work. So this piece was made in my bedroom, <laughs> which was acting as a photo studio, a printmaking studio, and like a living space and a library all at once. Um, so very limited resources. And again, my inspiration for this piece was like a long day on in like a marketplace and how shadows and light would sort of affect that um, scenario. And especially during the pandemic, the um, local crafts community is really get, was getting really hit by, uh, uh, was getting very uh, heavily impacted by the whole pandemic. So I was thinking about that and how these spots might just be sitting and not being sold at that the much grad, uh, gathering dust, light. And I wanted to capture the essence of time over these spots where they were sitting. So um, all the markings that are on this piece um, were created over the time of um, one week where I at every 5 p.m. because that is usually the time uh, when the market ends and everybody like packs up their shop and goes back. Uh, every 5 p.m. I would like open my windows and see whatever light was coming in and sketch it out. Mm. Um, and in like different colors. Um, so that's what the illustrative uh, coloring on this piece is about. Oh, that's so interesting. I also see that they're set up a bit in a corner shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so. and here's um, your corner, your corner yes. at the play studio. Exactly. Um, and then after graduation, I was very, very fortunate and lucky to um, be accepted to the Clay Studios residency. And this was my first setup, maybe like first month at the Clay Studio where I, everything was still clean, very little dust, not a lot happening, still trying to figure out what I want to make next. Um, and the next picture, next slide, is uh, the next slide is a week before my show opened where it's lots of different projects going on in, in every different corner had a little accident a little ceramic accident one of the days um uh, but yeah so really I really enjoyed this different slide where one picture is like, oh, there's everything is very clean on the table. And then it's just an explosion of clay. Well, it was great to see you, um, you know, talk with you as you were making work for the exhibition. And, um, you know, I think at one point we were talking about 
what worrying whether there would be enough work or what the work would be and we we sort of came to the conclusion that you should just enjoy yourself yeah <laughs> yep definitely um i was really uh stressing about how much so initially when this show when we were conceiving the show it was going to be in a different space which the sheer amount of space was very daunting to me because uh, this is uh, one of my bigger uh, exhibitions or actually the only big exhibition that I had the opportunity to do big, like uh, because usually you would have your grad thesis show that would sort of launch you into um, big exhibition experience um, but because of the pandemic uh, unfortunately, I missed out on that opportunity. So very grateful that I had the Clay Studio to organize this opportunity for me. Um, so yeah, when the Bonovitz Gallery became available, I think everything just fell in place on itself. And I was definitely less stressed and happier with the work and how everything was looking in the space. Yeah, and that's beautiful. So. Um... And we'll show everybody in a moment. You can go back when we're done with the with your slideshow. I love I love this one. Um, and this is this is the one that's up in the shop right now, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, it but light. minus minus the light um, fixture. Um, so this was one of my first pieces that I made at the clay studio, and I really wanted to experiment with some light and the porous quality of porcelain. I was slip casting a lot of the slabs and they were coming out really thin and workable and were very translucent because of the slip that I was using. So I definitely wanted to incorporate some light and um, capture, like again, the idea of a bird's eye view of a town or a city, but in the dark and how illuminate, uh, how it just lights up and creates a very uh, dreamlike visual. So this was an attempt to achieve that. Um, um, next slide, please. And a very, in, like very, in, I got some really interesting results. Uh, uh, one of the ideas I definitely want to visit in the future because uh, the, uh, during this attempt, I did not like the lights that I used and the quality of light that was coming through the piece. I would definitely prefer a more even panel instead of those LED lights that I have um, I had on in this time. So definitely a little more research to be done in the future with the kind of lights that I use. Um, so I will be revisiting this idea again in future projects. Yeah, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. it uh, and this is what the piece looks like. And this is how it's been displayed in the gallery right now. Um, if you stop by, please do check this one out as well. Um, and this was my attempt at really using the Matka form in its true scale. So Matka forms can be found um, in various sizes, but the most used and the most widely available size is a big, like a I want to say maybe like a 20 inch uh, tall pot, um, like 18 to 20 inch tall. So it'd be like this big and this wide. Um, so I wanted to, uh, so this was my first big blow up scale. I was really nervous about all the attachments that, that I was doing on top and how I would move it into the kiln and like move it out successfully because when it's uh, not fired everything is very very fragile and I always lose a lot of stuff um, in the moving process um, so this turned out really good I was using uh, a very dark stoneware for the color that it fires to I'm very intrigued by the darkness of that clay um, yeah and this was part of the residence show at the Clay Studios Gallery. Um, so I was very excited to be part, uh, be showing this work with all the other residents in a different setting. Yeah, and then I uh, would to give Naima an award for packing it 
Okay. Yes. Friendship oh. friendships. Mm -hmm. Oh, Naima, I'm I'm going to give her a big treat before I leave because uh, I I think I add so much work to her day with just packing and all the logistics that go behind shipping my work. Well, it uh, it's a it's a pleasure um, to do it for you. So don't worry about that. It's just uh, it's just good to acknowledge when we look at these things. Like, how are you going to get that in a box? But we figured yeah, that. I shouldn't say we. I even figured it out. <laughs> oh, here it is. Finished. Right? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Is this the same one or is this? Yeah, so this is the same piece, uh, and one of my solutions for um, like moving the pot and like logistically have it be successfully built was leave some room for the pot where it can be held from the top to be able to move because the base form is quite stable and strong even when it's not fired. It's only the little pieces that are attached on the surface that tend to fall off. Um, so just leaving a little space on the lip for my hand to sort of go in and hold it there um, helped a lot uh, with like making the whole moving process and like logistics of like making ceramics work um, a little bit easier. And I really like this quality, uh, which also like, because initially I wanted to just overwhelm the entire form with dense, dense uh, surface um, additions. But this little patch where it is small pieces would blow up and in envelope the rest of the pot sort of, I think adds a, another layer to the whole piece where you sort of see the growth happen and then overwhelm the piece. Um, so definitely that worked out. So now we can show a few pictures of the space and then um, Coco can head back over there in a moment. But this is the entry as you come in and see the, the first major piece. Um, and from what I understand, inspired at least partially by Philadelphia itself. Yes. Um, so this piece I call envelope. And again, the idea of just overwhelming a place with uh, dense, uh, start, like dense additions. Um, and then this idea of like having it in the corner or have it be like a wall and window space came from my walks around my neighborhood in Philadelphia where, where all the houses have this um, ivy going all over the corner and it's just beautiful and green and lush right now. And it's just, every time I look at it, it would create a very peaceful, um, visual for me so I wanted to capture that sense of peace and um, density um, into this piece and uh, incorporate this window where um, I all like the idea of windows and corner again the same idea of like looking out into the world um, um, so also this was like um, this time when I was like making work, a lot of different things were like happening in the world and like running uh, around my head where, um, and then COVID being uh, so prominently um, destructive in India right now uh, was really bothering me. And it always felt like even my family was getting affected, my friends were getting affected, but it felt like I was just watching everything from afar or from like through a screen or a window. So I wanted to incorporate that and also like create this overwhelming sort of uh, like structure where it looks like everything is just being encompassed by these pieces. And yet it is somewhat like, this notion of like finding peace in that um, and like little things that I've seen around Philadelphia. And like while I was making this piece, um, I, ha I had a really interesting conversation with Kevin, uh, one of the residents, Kevin Snipes, uh, where we, we were talking about, oh, so what's gonna go inside of the frame? And I was very, um, because at that moment, this piece was just in my studio with not that much light. 
um, like uh, I was think considering having some sketches on the inside to sort of uh, um, um, mimic the busy streets of India or like just the busy uh, sort of a quality within that because that's what I was sort of looking at. But when we started to install this piece in the gallery, there were these beautiful shadows that were being created by the studio uh, by the gallery lights, and it. Uh, it really stuck with me uh, because it did create that sense of uh, density inside the thing, but it also is shadows which are quiet and stable and uh, like supple, um, which seemed like the streets that might be right now when like people aren't allowed to go out that much and it's quieter and but all these places and structures like still exist. They're still the same. It's just, they're not very vibrant right now. Um, so I was very, so the shadows really helped me sort of um, finish this piece. Um, yeah, and it was great to install with you as well. The mm -hmm. idea that you wanted to, you made all these things, but you needed to put them on the wall and wrap it around the corner to really know exactly how they were going to be installed mm -hmm. so you're sort of letting the architecture um, mm -hmm. yeah. play a part in the installation which was great mm -hmm. um so this piece is called breath um again inspired uh by conceived during the horrible news that was coming out of India and uh, I was talking to my family one day and this was during like the second wave of COVID when there was a major major oxygen crisis due to lack of resources and just um, mismanaged government structures um, where um, oxygen supply was short and lots of people were losing their lives because of that and my father told me an incident in my uh region where like um an oxygen supply like few trucks of oxygen supplies were late by four to five hours because politicians were stopping them for photo ops and uh just uh with complete disregard for the crisis and what is at stake which is like common people and their lives and because of those delays, lots of people lost their lives, which didn't need to be lost. So it was just, um, so this piece was sort of made as an memor, uh, like as a memorial to like those lives that didn't need to be lost, but they were. And also as a reminder of um, like keeping your government accountable and like questioning authority and not, being complacent to um, uh, just like the structure yeah uh, basically yeah yeah well and um and also just information knowing that these are things mm -hmm. are happening and being willing to yeah. repeat that and mm -hmm. make sure people knew that it was and i know that's something that is uh mm -hmm. speaking out is brave so that's important mm -hmm. The, the, uh, so the next few slides are, I think, some close-ups of the work in the gallery. Yeah. Um, so we'll look through these. And then why don't you, um, I know we can see it in the pictures, but why don't you go back over, mm -hmm. I think um, it should be fine for the last couple of minutes. We'll see okay. the gallery, and you can answer any questions. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has questions, feel free to put them in the chat now and we can um, ask Kopal as she's finishing up and giving us a little tour of her space. I wanted to make sure that we got to see the gallery because this, as I said, because we have these recorded and, and held on our YouTube channel, it's really nice opportunity in the future for people to, to physically see the space. Um, and I don't think, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the, um, the pieces that are on the, your left? <laughs> yeah. So the, these pieces, yeah. 
these pieces were like one of the last pieces that I made for the show and they were inspired by the residents trip to uh, the Mercer and the Michener Museum in Doylestown where uh, we they have these big like stone houses uh, concrete houses with like large windows which create beautiful shadows on like in the corners again <laughs> and it was really beautiful and like I just remember walking through that space just thinking about wow this is a great opportunity and this is like sort of like the dream I had of like getting this kind of an exposure um, but at the same time there is like so much so many things that are going on with my family back home and in India so these pieces were sort of like my direct way of compartmentalizing my life into like two pieces where I'm living this individual life here right now which is like focused on my career and what I want to do with life but then there is this whole different part of my heart and my family which is like back home that is um not been like I'm not able to give that much time to um so this is these this was the piece that came out of that so I'm gonna get you a little bit closer to that thanks yeah and I love that even the color you've chosen to kind mm -hmm. of wash and create those um window mullion shapes mm -hmm. is this light um positive kind of happy color and then mm -hmm. the um the other sections are are kind of being hidden a little bit and being um you can see that i mean it literally the corners of your mind kind of yeah. figuring out how to put these different spaces together mm -hmm. and that's just really beautiful the idea and the and the way you've executed it i, I love those pieces yeah the, yeah these were very like again our conversation about just having fun and see what comes out of that um sort of an ocean yeah so this is yeah that one yeah. yeah um so i've used some a uh, hundred percent real imitation gold on it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i said i asked copal well let's make sure that when we price it we think about all that the gold that you used and she said what do you mean it wasn't very expensive and then she read the label it said real imitation gold so we thought that was funny 100 percent real 100 percent so great um yeah and those those pieces which are sort of in my mind a little bit related maybe tell us about that mm. in terms of you're sort of covering up the these under underlying structures that for you in your verbal in your visual language kind of indicate India and then you've put like a fabric over and you've put um you know that the mesh over the other one are those kind of telling that same story of uh, what lies beneath mm -hmm. uh yeah I was uh, really working through this idea of um again like the square um, was like windows and like what I'm seeing through it and uh, are there like there are like some parts of um, like life there that I am not most pleased with and uh, uh, just the struggles that go along with that uh, conversation because everywhere you live there are something that you enjoy about the place and there are something that are a little bit problematic. Um, so this was just like playing with the notion of that and sort of trying to, um, so these two pieces were somewhat experimental where I was trying to find my visual language where how I wanted to sort of um, narrate that idea without it being very um, illustrative. Mm. Um, um, so yeah, um, so I thought of maybe having a base of these little structures and then adding something on top of it to sort of add that meaning of discomfort and uh, add that layer of discomfort or um, disagreement essentially. So this jaggedy wire structure would be uh, 
maybe a symbol of that and then cover like the fabric that like overlaps the whole thing um, could be something um, like could illustrate that notion. Um, so these two pieces were just me sort of resolving out a way to like find an accurate visual representation for yeah. thoughts. Um, and then these two pieces, again, the corners yeah. are back. And uh, these pieces came from like the obsessive drawings that I did during quarantine, just looking at lights outside my apartment. And I wanted to capture that um, feeling within these pieces as well of like light in the dark and um, just keeping that hope up uh, and like seeing how things play itself out. And those have the quality of printmaking kind of, I think, um, and that's something that you also studied at RISD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I am I am really interested in etching as a technique. It is deeply associated with ceramics. They have a very overlapping uh, process, a very process intensive uh, mediums, both of them. Um, and I had an opportunity to take a few classes at RISD where I learned some uh, etching, and etching and uh, like reductive carving in. Uh, ceramics are essentially sort of um, a very similar process where you can fill up ink into the lines and then wipe it off. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I was trying to sort of use in these spaces to add a little texture to the darkness. Yeah. And that texture also adds a lot of like movement within the piece, mm -hmm. even though it's dark, I didn't want it to be just flat and dark. I wanted there to be some chaos and movement within the darkness. Um, Systematic so. chaos. So. Yes, <laughs> sticking with the theme. Uh, and then finally, you have a couple of your... Um, yeah, I also uh, included of my matka pieces. They're, these ones are relatively small um, and they are arranged here. And this one's my favorite ceramic happy uh, coincidence accident piece. This is a soda fired piece, which, oh. came out, which came out evenly gray all around. Um, so it was whoever placed it in the kiln, uh, placed it at a perfect sweet spot where it is evenly gray all around. And um, so this was my first experience with soda firing as well. I really wasn't sure what I was going to get. And um, the pieces that I had seen before had a very orange hue to them, which I was not interested in. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to put one piece in the kiln and see how that turns out. And then voila, this comes yep. out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> collaboration then, with whoever put it in the kiln. Exactly. Um, so since then, I've been longing to get my hands on another soda firing. Um, hopefully, I will get to do that soon. And maybe I can learn a little more about that entire process and probably figure out how to uh, recreate this result eventually. Well, we can do, you can do that when you come back as a guest artist in the new building because we will have a soda kiln. Yes, that would be wonderful. I am already looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, and then this piece is sort of hard to see right now, but this is enveloped. Yeah. Um, so stretches all around the wall um, to the side. And then I'm going to try to focus on the shadow a little bit. Okay. The creates oh, yeah, shadows. Yeah. I spent like good two, three hours <laughs> messing with the lights to make the shadows happen. And another thing that I'm looking forward to in the future with my future work is understanding how like lights work and how I can make more intentional shadows going forward and potentially um, some pieces that involve shadows again. Yeah, yeah, and the figuring out the shadows and the pieces that maybe have the lights within them, and it's very exciting, lots of stuff to work on. Well, this has been so lovely, and um, 
I'll just a little, apologize a little for the movement, but it was no problem really. So I think it's just great. Thank you, Josie, for letting us use <laughs> your desk for a few minutes. Um, Topol, it's been lovely having you here for a year. I wish you could stay longer, but uh, we, like I said, we'll look forward to seeing you back in the studio in the future. Um, does anyone, I think there might've been one question, but I think you also answered it. Nache was asking um, if you created the, the shadows intentionally and uh, you were just telling us how you did and you spent so much time with the lights. So that kind of answers that question. Um, I, I, I stumbled upon them unintentionally, but then I really wanted to hone that in and include that and have it be part of the work. Yeah, um, so that's, every time we do something, we take something from the experience. So hopefully that'll be interesting to explore. Um, if anyone is able to come in, if you haven't seen the show yet, you have until the end of the day on Sunday, and I really do encourage you to come. Each piece is so such a beautiful, um, as I said, as we were saying, consideration with the lighting and, and so wonderfully made. So you have to see it in person to really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kopal. Thank you. Thank you for having me as a resident. It was a wonderful opportunity. I'm really looking forward to coming back again in the future. Um, and thank you all for um, joining us and in like listening to me talk about my work. Uh, it was great. I loved it. And it'll be um, now safe for anyone in the future. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Copal. Have a great day, everyone. See you next week. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Chuck. Bye, everybody.